lean back in your seat as yours truly, Dr. Bruce, and KSCO Radio AM 1080 owner Michael Zwirling take in a barrage of callers from a mostly politically right-of-center listenership. They were responding to my call in the last Levity Zone podcast for the convening of a constitutional convention to radically remake our governance here in the USA. This show aired in Santa Cruz, California on November 19th, 2011 at the height of the Occupy movement. Before we dive into the fray, let me give you brief bullet points on the document I penned just before this show aired. It's called By and For the 99%, a visionary blueprint for a radical remake of America or any country. It sets forth my own take on what should be taken up by a future constitutional convention in five easy, or not so easy, points. Point number one, a radical remaking of our political system by cutting the umbilical cord between money and elected officials, updating the U.S. electoral system to the highest standards of a modern, plural, multi-party, direct democracy. All sitting federal politicians are voted from office by decree from the convention floor, which, by the way, is open to everyone except professional politicians and their influencers. Also, at the opening of the convention, the two main political parties are dissolved, and new elections scheduled with a healthy slate of new candidates and parties that really represent the diverse population of the nation. This election will happen after the convention concludes. Point number two. Reassuming control of the messages we say to ourselves by reasserting earlier rules preventing lying on the air, reining in divisive extremist messages in the media, and returning to a level of truthful, trustworthy information sharing that helps us build better communities. In addition, all branches of government would adopt the highest transparency standards and reward, not persecute, whistleblowers. Point number three, end of warmongering and state-sponsored terrorism. This would happen through the immediate withdrawal of the U.S. from its wars of economic and political interest, including the support of surrogate states which has collectively traumatized and radicalized populations around the world and is the true cause of terrorism. And point three would give the military a vote on whether to go to war, roll back the size and influence of the military-industrial complex, and institute a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to identify, punish, and transition U.S. black ops and other government operatives from their continuing egregious violation of human rights at home and abroad. Point number four, prosecution for economic crimes and a return to healthy markets would have conventioneers vote on finally going after those who game economic systems, concentrate wealth, wreck the economy, and jeopardize our future. Well-supported measures would be put in place to back the country away from the precipice of debt collapse and develop a healthy alternative economy based on investment in public infrastructure, education, health, and renewable resources leading to point five, which is that the national priority from this point out would be to sustain a healthy civil society. Dear Levity listeners, Please understand that this is just my laundry list of what could be taken up at a constitutional convention. Like our callers, you will undoubtedly have your own list. Before we hear from those callers, I will leave you with the following words about Lawrence Lessig's book, Republic Lost, which together with my radical remake blueprint, is available at www.levityzone.org for this podcast number 32. I have known Larry since 1997 and supported his innovative world-changing projects, such as the Creative Commons. As you will hear next from a review of his book, he is tackling the challenge of a radical remake head-on. 
Rejecting simple labels and reductive logic, and instead using examples that resonate as powerfully on the right as on the left, Lessig seeks out the root causes of our situation. He plums the issues of campaign financing and corporate lobbying, revealing the human faces and follies that have allowed corruption to take such a foothold in our system. He puts the issues in terms that non-wonks can understand, using real-world analogs and real human stories. And ultimately, he calls for widespread mobilization and a new constitutional convention, presenting achievable solutions for regaining control of our corrupted, but redeemable, representational system. In this way, Lessig plots a roadmap for returning our republic to its intended greatness. Alright, we are talking about a radical remake of our nation. And that makes the most sense of all to me. 479-1080 is the phone number if you want to call the Saturday special today uh, with MZ and our special guest, Dr. Bruce Damer. You're calling from somewhere close to New York City. You're in the state of New Jersey now, yes? Yes, indeed, yep. Okay. And do, do you have a, a home there, or you and your wife? We do. Uh, it's a little kind of like a summer cottage Pretty really funky, almost like it would have been from Santa Cruz, but plunked on a lake here in New Jersey. Oh, my gosh. And if you were to ring off right now and make a beeline for uh, the site of Occupy Wall Street, how long would it take you for you to be there? We could be there in an hour, actually. We're hoping to go uh, down. In fact, this radio program and this effort on Radical Remake is what I've been focusing all my energy on. We have two wonderful volunteers that are also working on this, one of them from Occupy Santa Cruz. And I'm hoping that if this can get some traction, and it's starting to, that I can go down to Occupy and... And maybe, maybe get, some, get some time and be able to get up and make a talk. Or, yeah, or... we can use the human, uh, the human megaphone. This week was the confrontation and then the counter confrontation. You know, that's stuff for experienced people. You know, if you look at those helicopter views from Thursday, it's like, wow. So the time for discussion of possibilities forward, I think, is now dawning because the message has gotten across. Okay. So 479 1080 is the number to call if you want to help the message get even further across. We're talking with Bruce Damer. want to talk with you. As promised, our first caller will be Paul and Carmel. Paul, you're on the air. Good morning, gentlemen. As uh, usual, you always have a stimulating conversation to start off the morning with and get it. I cheated. I, I borrowed it from the futures. I have a question for Bruce because, you know, I like his concept. Um, of course, you know, a conventional constitution is a very dangerous thing, especially when you don't have the kind of deep thinkers that our forefathers were. They came from an oppression. They were driven. They uh, lived it. They had this experience. They knew what they did not want. They believed in individual sovereign rights. And they knew that that was going to be the basis of this newfound world experiment. Getting to the question for Bruce is, one of the things that our forefathers did not do, when they looked at business as far as corporations, they had no intention of having businesses be sovereign entities. And I believe that that's what we need to kind of get back to, is, is that when you have a business and you're a single proprietorship, Yes, you should have constitutional rights because you are taking all the risk. It is your business. It's something that you gave life to. But when we fail, I think we failed when we gave corporations who are no longer a single sovereign person constitutional rights. And I think that's really a big issue because who do you answer to? Who's the individual? Who's the sovereign citizen that is actually being affected? In corporations, there is no entity. It's a board. They're individuals. They're protected from their own personal loss, unlike a single proprietor where, you know, if he loses his business, it's his house that's on the line. It's his livelihood that's on the line. And I think we kind of failed when we gave corporations that citizenship of constitutionality. Hmm. What do you think, Bruce? Paul is absolutely right on the mark. And in fact, Larry Lessig, uh, who's just a tremendous legal mind and fighter, 
he's been called the closest thing to a framer or a founding father of a new republic as, as anyone in the land. And his book, Republic Lost, How Money Corrupts Congress and a Plan to Stop It, has just come out and he's touring the country. And if your caller will allow me, I'd like to read a quotation from there that's relevant to his thought. Sure. And this is from Adam Smith, who, as you know, was the founding father of modern free market economics from the time of the founding of the nation. And he wrote that people of the same trade, and this is in, you're talking 18th, 19th century language here, people of the same trade seldom meet each other, even for merriment and diversion. But the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. So this was the thinking uh, that was very much going on at the time of the founding of the Republic. And one thing to point out that your callers may not know that Jefferson, one of the great framers of the founding document, uh, when he left his presidency, he wrote a letter that said, I tried and I couldn't. Uh, at the time, I wanted a constitutional convention to be held regularly between uh, generations so that we could constantly allow the people to directly update the document and protect us. And all of the founding fathers were cognizant of the power of, of merchants and the self-interest because, in fact, they were all self-interested merchants who gave up that self-interest temporarily to come together for a greater benefit. So one thing Larry Lessig calls for is the rollback of those two terrible Supreme Court decisions. Now, who can argue with that? I can't. When I said, who can argue with that? I can't. There was a pregnant silence that just went on and on and on. And I don't know why. We have our Supreme Court justices who presumably read American history and they've read a lot of the commentaries at the time of the founding of the Republic. How could they possibly pass laws that they do now, or rules, how could they make rulings that they do now with the clearly expressed warnings of the founding fathers and the framers? It just boggles the mind. You ask the question, is this even a functional Supreme Court? Uh, obviously, in the year 2000, it wasn't. It failed the people. We may have to look at a radical remake there. Well, now, wait a minute. Wait, wait just a minute. Wasn't it the Supreme Court that decided you know, the outcome of the 2000 presidential election. They basically threw it back to the state just before the deadline, and it kind of fell apart. The one one Supreme Court justice uh, at the time, I remember his comment, it was a written comment in the decision, which was, never have so few disenfranchised so many. Well, I think the other argument, too, is, is that, you know, our, our forefathers, they had a basic understanding of what a gentleman's agreement is. Yeah. You know, we select officials and we have, you know, our representatives who take this oath to quote unquote defend the Constitution of, of the United States. And some of them have never read it. They don't, you know, those are just words that they're swearing an oath to. I mean, I thought it kind of unusual that when Baynard, you know, actually read the Constitution in the House of the Representatives for the very first time, I mean, I was shocked at, at the idea that here we have a bunch of elected officials reading the Constitution for the very first time, and they've been spouting on as if they knew anything about it. Yeah, it's pretty outrageous. Hey, well, Paul, you know, thanks, thanks for your call this Saturday special. we got quite a number of other people here. Uh, we want to get to Ace and Live Oak Jack and Salinas, Jimmy and Scotts Valley. And we're talking with Dr. Bruce Damer about the notion of having a, a constitutional convention. In fact, having multiple constitutional conventions. Am I, am I right, Bruce? I mean, the, the place needs to be re rebuilt altogether, doesn't it, the whole country? It does. And, you know, we see the stresses on the system as, you know, our good friends over in the Tea Party, you know, they had a powerful movement and a very clear message. And what happened to them? Well, they penetrated inside the Beltway and the amoeba of the Beltway. But then what happens? The dark bubble descends and all those people who are inside the Beltway, and, and if you've been to Washington, you've been involved, in, as I have in, in activities in Washington, there's a reality bubble that is, descends upon you and then you realize, I don't know where I came from, I'm now part of the organism and I must raise money, must raise money, and you get gobbled up. So it's, uh, yeah, well that, I mean, sort of everybody's like that. That's just what I did when I told people that they should buy Kay's book because we do need to raise money to keep KSEO. Everybody needs to raise money to keep everything going. I mean, that's the economic reality of life.
but not uh, the kind of money that the uh, politician must raise and the kind of well that is true uh by the way um ellie kramer has written a, a sort of nasty email here i sh i probably shouldn't read it because of its nastiness but I'm going to read it because it does bring up a point that I was going to uh, bring up. And we keep talking about this being a democracy, and I always thought it was a, a representative uh, democracy, or, you know, representative government. Uh, MZ, if I were the judge that granted your guests U.S. citizenship, I would ask for it back. It appears like other lefties of his ilk. He judges the health of the Supreme Court by how it decides a case to his favor or not. He thinks this is a democracy. What about the democratic republic that it actually is? Learn about what you discuss before you open your mouth. And that's from Ellie Kramer, who used to be a talk host on this station. Ellie, you should call and engage a discussion here with, uh, with Bruce. It would be very interesting. Anyhow, Bruce, what do you think? I'd love to talk to Ellie. You know, I hear the anger in his voice, and I think the frustration that he has and there's some energy there. And obviously, if he's a talk show host, he's got something to contribute. And, and this Radical Remake site that we've launched is for input, for him to put his words in, for him to put his opinion in, for him to be heard. Uh, this is not just about Bruce Damer. I'm, I'm hoping just to seed this. I want to encourage 10,000 drafters. There, there, it. Ellie Kramer. Now, don't you feel terrible that you were so nasty to uh, our guest and he's so kind and gentle back to you? Anyhow, here's uh, our next caller, Asa in Live Oak. You're on the air on KSCO, Asa. Hi, well, I'm outclassed by all your callers. However, I'm more ancient than all your callers, so I, I, I presume the, or the right of age to say a word or two. And my, from my standpoint, I love our Constitution the way it is. I love our people the way they are. I love our mess the way it is. And I am frightened that there are people that want to change it into something that is much more rigid and gives me much less freedom and will not tolerate the fact that I've grown old. They want to, you know... I, I you know, Bruce, fact. wait a second. Wait, Asa, just a second. We'll let you talk. But, Bruce, I think you need to make it clear to people that you don't want to, to kill the, the Constitution. You just want to sort of update it. Am I right? Yeah, we want to be true to what Jefferson wanted, which is Jefferson wanted a convention to be held, you know, regularly so that the citizenry and, and the whole member society could say, we love this document, and we, we preserve it. It's precious. But we need to add this amendment, but the amendments would, would come directly from the needs of the day. We need to add this. We need to do that. We kind of do it in a haphazard way right now, but it's really about that. So that, Izzy, if, if you had an idea, you could put it in. And if enough other people thought it, it held water... By God, it might be something that was added to the fundamental document. Oh, my God, we have less than a minute for the, the news. But go ahead. Freedom, get, yeah, go ahead. The Aaron. ideas of freedom and individual liberty are precious, and they are not to be lost by people's little ideas of George Soros and his ilk that helped finance this whole thing. I really want our freedom and liberty and personal liberty and freedom to be preserved, and I don't see how any great mass of people who are poorly educated because our educational system has been so bad, creating a document that is in the any way superior. Asa, do document. you want us to hold you over? We got the news in 10 seconds. No, I have, I'm uh, not right. that. I'm, well, thank I, you for I, calling I, the I, Saturday I, special. It's KSCO Santa Cruz, Salinas, Monterey, San Jose, back in six back minutes. In six our special guest is uh, is Dr. Bruce Damer, who has written an amazing uh, treatise, an amazing uh, draft of a uh, radical remake of America. Uh, Bruce is uh, here uh, via Skype. He's actually in uh, New Jersey. Yes, Bruce? Yes, indeedy. Okay. And we've invited callers to 479-1080 and emailers to mz at ksco.com. We're going to go back to the phones now and uh, sort of zoom through this if possible here. We're going to go to line three, and that's uh, none other than Jack in Salinas. Hey, Jack, welcome to KSCO. You're on. Hello, Michael. Hi, Bruce. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, point out that you don't have to look all the way to Washington, D.C. to see how the voters have been disenfranchised by our current government. You can see it right here in the California state government. Uh, I'm thinking uh, Proposition 187 uh, and more, more recently Proposition 8. And I'm sure, Michael, you can think of uh, many cases where 
individuals have been disenfranchised and, and not given a voice right there in Santa Cruz County by the uh, city council or the uh, county government. Uh, I'm not, not concerned about them. I'm they're, they, they're all given a voice on KSCO if they choose to use it. Right, but I'm just saying that you don't have to look all the way to Washington, D.C. to see how, oh, how sure. voters have been disenfranchised. Yes. Here in California, we uh, the voters uh, voted for Proposition 187. They were disenfranchised by the state Supreme Court. Uh, they voted for Proposition 8, where they were disenfranchised by the Supreme Court. So that's kind of the point that I, I wanted to bring up. It seems like the uh, intellectual class in this country is kind of out of touch to me. Do you have any comments on that? Remember when there was uh, a few years ago when the election for governor was sort of thrown up in the air and all kinds of people came forward from Arianna Huffington to, of course, uh, our last governor, uh, Schwarzenegger. But lots of people decided they were going to throw their hats in the ring. And for a moment, for a moment, California had almost a pluralistic electoral system, just a glimmer of it. And, of course, it fell back down into just two parties, which is, of course, a huge problem that there's only two political parties of power in the country. That's It's a ludicrous situation. No other country has such a situation. Uh, but that could only be addressed really at the national level. Right. Uh, it seems to me, though, that a lot of times people in charge allow their, their ideological views to disenfranchise the will of the people. And I think that is a, that is a big problem. Yeah, and of course For, there's somebody, there's someone in between them and you, and it's called a broker. And that broker is a lobbyist who represents powerful money interests, and that is their true constituency. And you may have remembered uh, G.W. Bush, that famous dinner speech uh, he did about, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago uh, at a banquet for wealthy donors uh, to his campaign. And he said, you are my base. And of course, that's true. Money is a problem. Money, money definitely is a problem. But uh, aside from money, I, I see an even deeper problem where individuals who are in power in government believe that they know better than the citizens and they are not willing to listen to the citizens. And when the citizens vote, they believe they have the right to tell the citizens, no, your vote is not correct, like they did in California several times with the with the initiative process. That is exactly my point, and I, I think that's that's what I'm trying to say. Is I think the intellectual class in this this country is not in touch with the population, not the people who who have the money and the time to sit in in a park in New York City, but the people who are out there working 12 hour days to feed their kids. Those are the people I'm talking about. Salinas Jack vote. is is right, uh, Bruce. There's no question that he's right. There is no question he's right, and in no. fact. You know, Alan Lundell said it on the Dr. Future show. He, I wouldn't have said it this way, but uh, he said, well, then throw the bums out. Yeah. Now, now, who would argue with that? That's what everybody I know thinks. Hey, listen, uh, we want to thank uh, Salinas Jack for calling. It's time for our good friend uh, Jimmy in Scotts Valley to be on the air. Hey, Hi. I'm Z. Hey. Thanks a lot for having me on the air. You're welcome. Thank you for calling and waiting. Bruce. Thanks for being such a thoughtful person and looking out for the uh, for the people and trying to come up with a great idea. Most welcome. I mean, where do I start? <laughs> um, I don't know. It just seems to me that um, if you're looking at the solution of a constitutional convention, you might have the same kind of problems that presented themselves with the election of Barack Obama, because. What happened with Barack Obama is he promised change, but change meant something different to every individual who heard him say it. And so when those people voted for Barack Obama, they thought that he was going to represent the change that they had in their mind, whatever that might be, and the war, uh, you know, whatever health care, whatever it was, they thought they were going to solve that problem. And so they elected him, and he got in, and he didn't really do any of the things that he talked about doing. And the same thing would happen with a constitutional convention, because if you can entice the people into uh, opening up a constitutional convention, then the people that are in control of that convention are the ones that are really going to dictate what uh, changes are made to the Constitution. You are absolutely on target. So when I drafted the blueprint, the preamble... You know, there was a famous preamble written for, for our original Constitution, but the kind of preamble to it said, you know what? All the sitting politicians are out of office. They have resigned their offices before the convention starts, and the first vote on the floor of the convention, which is done by direct citizen vote, everyone online, at polling stations connected online, 
the first of maybe a dozen new laws that are voted directly in cuts the umbilical cord between money and the body politic. It makes lobbying illegal. So you're now starting with a clean slate. And all those lobbyists on K Street, they can go home. They can go have uh, have a barbecue, and they're not participants. Um, I think the problem is is that uh, the first caller that called in, I don't remember who what his name was, but but the thing is, is he brought up a very interesting and important point in this whole thing, and that is, I don't like lobbyists in any shape, way, or form. But the problem is, uh, the Constitution allows for redress of grievances, and so if, if you make a Constitution a citizen or a person and has the same rights as a citizen, then those corporations have the right to send lobbyists to lobby because they're recognized as a person and they have rights to redress their grievances. If there's laws or restrictions on them doing business, they they have the right to go there and do that. You could even draft a proposal that the second law that was directly voted upon at the convention would be to roll back this whole idea of corporations being persons to previous uh, accepted norms, which were in place. And because the people are directly voting, they will cut that second umbilical cord at but this you're convention. Make, you're making it a majority rule, like a mob rule situation, because there's a lot of people out there that want the Constitution to kind of stay the way that it is. So, I mean, you'd have to, to abolish the Constitution in order to have the, the type of change that you're talking about. I, not, think, you're, not, I not, think you're... Not at all. Not at all. Uh, in fact, the convention, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but it would preserve the original Constitution, but... Most of the bad doo-doo that's come up is extra constitutional rules and amendments and things that the framers themselves... Yeah, that's what needs to be for thrown out, huh? It's the dross around the document. And and a lot of that stuff has, has been kicked in in the last only about 15 years. I mean, you're talking about stuff that... I've just, just from a political standpoint, I mean, I've heard I've heard people bring up the... Uh, constitutional convention quite a bit in relation to real hot button issues um, that you can you know throw these issues out in any conversation and get a bunch of heated phone calls about immigration or abortion or these issues i think it's really great that you're trying to come up with a solution but i really think that like the 80 20 rule pretty much governs what happens and so 80 percent of the people are going to dictate what goes on if you have a direct uh, voting, like you're talking about, a direct democracy, it, it really goes against, you know, the democratic republic that we have. And I understand that a lot of the people in Congress are just not people that you want to have uh, there. But unfortunately, I mean, the only way that you could really do the kind of change you're talking about is to start from scratch. Absolutely. You can hit the nail on the head. Yeah, it's a starting from scratch. Well, yeah, start from scratch with the, with the same template because everyone agrees that the you know the, the original template is a is a damn good one. Hey, Jimmy in Scotts Valley, thanks for calling the Saturday special. Here's our next caller, RC and Aptos. Thanks for waiting, RC. You're on the air. Yeah, great topic. Uh, thank you. Uh, I believe that we do need a constitutional convention, and I would uh, uh, point to uh, our representatives selling out our economy to the Wall Street bankers. Our national debt, which how does the richest country in the world rack up a $15 trillion debt, and the wars that we're always in. And I really don't see how our representatives can take us down another path other than debt and war and selling us out to the banking lobbies. But the problem that I have is that it it goes beyond lobbying. And, for example, the Super Committee right now, they can't agree on cutting spending. It's not that they, ha- that they disagree on the cuts that they need to make. It's that both sides, both Republicans and Democrats in that Super Committee, they both agree that they're not going to jump off a cliff together and support some type of you know, massive spending cuts in either social programs or defense programs. They're just not going to do it. Their, their biggest priority is their re-election. And if they do something ridiculous, it's in their mind, like beginning to start cutting spending uh, or pulling back uh, our military to a certain extent, they're not going to be re-elected. My solution, uh, I don't really believe you have to make lobbyists illegal. The, 
problem that I have with our system is the campaign. The campaign, in my opinion, is what's wrong. And if you eliminate camp political campaigns, there won't be any influence uh, from lobbyists because they don't have campaign money to bring to the system. So you eliminate campaigns altogether, and you and you choose your representatives, or you figure out a particular way to maintain our representative democracy without the element of the campaign. Because as long as there's a campaign to be run, in my opinion, we're going to go down the same path that we're on right now. Because, for example, the Iraq war, it wasn't corporate lobbyists that told John Kerry, Hillary Clinton, and John Edwards to take the country to war. It was their campaign advisors who had told them that if they didn't sign on to a popular war, it would impact their ability to run for president, which they all wanted to do. They all were sorry about that vote when it was uh, obvious that the war didn't turn out as well as their campaign advisors told them that it would. But in my opinion, it it isn't the corporate lobbyists that are the be-all and end-all. It's the political campaigns that our uh, representatives have to give the most influence to. Okay, uh, thanks very much for your call, uh, RC. Sure. Our, ne- our next caller is going to be uh, Margaret in Santa Cruz. So let's put Margaret on the air. Margaret, you're on uh, KSEO. Hi. Hi. So to get this country radically renewed, like your show promo analogy, a radical mastectomy, you, know, you have to begin with the courts, the core of corruption, and why are all these justices in there for life? I mean, that's their preference, not their bosses, which is we the people. And instead of okay, adding, these are all things that would be com- that would come up in a constitutional convention, Margaret. I mean, that's which is great. What, what do you, Bruce? Uh, Margaret makes some good but, points, and that's but, what that's why we need a constitutional convention to update everything, right? Absolutely. And you know, when you look at it, you if you have the constitutional convention, and you have people looking back through history, and you can say, okay. The Supreme Court is actually nominated politically. And let's do a comparison between other countries that don't have political nomination of judges. The judges basically, you know, promote and and nominate themselves from within their own ranks based on merit versus a politically nominated Supreme Court. And you might determine at the convention said, guys, this is creating a swinging back and forth that is so damaging. And we've seen the damage that it's done. That we ought to change the way we nominate our justices, or yeah, but no, why don't we? Why, why don't we instead of adding to the Constitution? Why aren't we first and foremost just best being served by adhering to the original Constitution? The only reason we're in this trouble is because our original Constitution isn't being respected or adhered to. Margaret, thank you very much uh, for your call to the Saturday special, Downtown Al. Go ahead, Downtown Al. You're on. Hey, uh, great show as usual. Um, I, I just wonder, it's Bruce, right? Yep, that's me. Um, I, I'm sure you realize the inherent danger in what you're proposing. And I might suggest actually a more modest proposal. Um, m- most of the regulations and problems that we have to deal with are at a local level. And I think it would be more useful maybe to really look at like a county or city and do it kind of in an experimental way, basically trying to revise as many things locally I, you know, I kind of look towards uh, natural systems and particular like evolution in terms of like you work with what you have and the cutting edge is out there at, at the outer margins where basically where the rubber meets the road. And, for example, I think there's a lot we could do just within our state to see how it works. And what's been so great or successful, I think, in this country is the fact that we have had all these 50 states at this point that are individual little experiments in democracy and representative democracy. And I wonder if you have any proposals at that point, because there really is an inherent danger in a constitutional convention, because I'm not sure we have a unified American culture anymore. If you look back at the origins of the founding fathers coming from England and the the systems that they were familiar with, I'm not sure that we have that. And it isn't always just moneyed lobbyists that can create a lot of problems. For example, we have a lot of race baiters in this country, and I'm not sure that they're heavily backed, but they seem to wield a huge amount of power. For now, example, just uh, jumping in here, because I know we're, our time is short, I want to address some of your excellent points. 
Yes, the 50 states are an ecological proving ground for new and wonderful ways to run our affairs. And in fact, at a convention, they would all be presented as models. But the second thing, I think it's a more vital point, is the national political system, the moneyed industrial military financial system is running off the rails. And we may not have that many more years to go before we have a full-on crash. So in a sense, the, uh, the patient has already been wheeled into the emergency room and something needs to be done soon. Otherwise, you know, we could have a, a dire situation. And in that circumstance, it'll be very hard to get a common American convention together or anything in reasonable sense because we'll have had a full failure. And so it's kind of late in the day, but the power of innovation out in, in the hinterlands where we are uh, is going to come. And I believe that Americans are still Americans and they will come together and they're decent to each other, they're friendly to each other, and the extremists that are out there won't have much of an ability to have a voice when, when ordinary Americans get going. I mean, I hope you're right about that because, you know, a lot of these religious interests, they're not necessarily driven by money. They're driven by ideologies, okay? And the same with a lot of those race baiters. I, I'm not sure there is a heavily, you know, moneyed interest behind them. It might be just a lot of individuals who really believe in what they're talking about, you know, and that includes the anti-abortion people, too, as well as the pro-abortion people. So it isn't just uh, well-moneyed lobbyists that can create a lot of havoc in this country. Completely agree, but you'd probably also agree that it's probably a fairly small number of people who create most of the havoc, uh, whether they be in ideological sense, money sense. It's actually probably fewer than 500 people that have gotten us into this mess. Uh, I want to thank you, Downtown true. Al, for, for okay. your call to the Saturday special. Always a great caller. Um, see, I wanted just to say how much we appreciated Kay's commentary and and, and to also point out, uh, wonderfully, uh, there's some wonderful synchronicity in that there's a point, the third or fourth point down in the blueprint, is the implementation of Kay's idea. Of basically, all the politicians, not only have they left office, but all sitting and all past politicians are moved to Social Security. And that's the end of their entitlement program. So that, that is in there, in the blueprint proposal already. So Kay should be very supportive of you and what you're trying to do. Well, you know, Warren Buffett also proposed this. He said, I know how to fix the deficit, you know, get rid of all of the entitlement for Congress and the president. Yeah. Okay. Well, my goodness, look at all the phone callers we have. And I should check the email box, too. Yeah, we've got a bunch of people who, oh, I should read this. Uh, I should read this short email from Bob Champion. We do not need to change the Constitution. We simply need to elect more people and appoint more judges who are strict constitutionalists. That's the Tea Party's position with which I most fully agree. And that's Bob in Carmel. Okay, thank you, Bob in Carmel. Is there something else here? Let's see. Oh, Melody Mood is very upset. Why are you airing the enemy mouthpiece, CNN? Couldn't you at the very least air Alex Jones's nightly news? Well, they're different things, Melody Mood. Alex Jones's nightly news is not top of the hour news. Now, I had to give Fox News the heave ho recently because they demanded that we turn over more of KSCO's program time to them. And I said, no. And they said, well, you can't have our news anymore. And I said, see you around. So that's why we have CNN, because they were thrilled to have KSCO and not take over our entire program schedule. You understand? I don't consider CNN the enemy, and you shouldn't either. Enemy mouthpiece, CNN. Okay, hopefully I've answered Melanie Mood's question. <sighs> you just can't win. You just can't win. Okay, um, White Paper says... Um, <clears throat> Constitutional convention would be a disaster. I agree with Ellie Kramer, number one. For the guest to continually call the country a democracy discredits everything he says. The word democracy doesn't appear in the U.S. Constitution or in any state constitution. Number two, 80% of the problems 
like war that he mentioned, would be cured by our present constitution if we defeated those politicians ignoring it. Number three, his stakeholders, in quotes, the foundations, multinationals, lobbyists, billionaires, plus their thousands of nonprofit fronts, would swamp the bedraggled group that might borrow enough money to show up. Number four, Americans are in no position to throw out what is left and be raped by forces that already have drafted a number of new constitutions. He doesn't mention those, showing more naivety. Number five, how about teaching the Constitution in the schools once again and end the habit of reflecting and re-electing and re-electing the dopes to office? We need to inform ourselves about our Constitution and dump the traitors. A constitutional convention would be a disaster and the end, uh, end of America. And that's from Gary Richard Arnold, uh, a.k.a. White Paper. Okay, back to the phone lines we go now. Let's go to Phil in Santa Cruz, who's on line one. Phil, welcome to the Saturday special with um, Bruce Damer and MZ. You're on. Hi. Uh, I think that it would be very a very simple fix to the Constitution. The Constitutional Convention, I think, would probably deteriorate, especially the way he's outlined it, into uh, into a disaster that was predicted about 3,000 years ago by the Greeks. We're slowly getting there. That is, the majority, when they find out they can vote themselves, largesse at the expense of the minority, it's all over from there, and, and we're about two-thirds of the way there. But anyway, um, I think it would be a simple thing, one amendment to the Constitution that states something to the effect that there would be a required ID for each voter required in every state for federal elections, and voter fraud would be punished as the highest felony that the land has, up to and including death. Because I think voter fraud is the highest form of treason, no matter what side you're on. Right now, it's laughed at. It's been found out, dug out here in this county, and the judge just throws it out and says, well, by my calculations, it didn't affect the election. Doesn't matter. I think that uh, then the mechanism intended by the founding fathers of the root of power being in the people and their voting would be preserved and let them campaign all they want to, let them spend all they want to. It would depend on the intelligence of the people and their their common sense. And if they fail that test, so be it. It seems a little harsh what you're suggesting. Uh, who, who would be executed under your plan? The the the, perp- well, the perpetrant of the uh, per- per- perpetrant is there such a word of the um, of the voter perpetrator of the voter fraud. Yes, I think they would have their full rights to a trial by jury. They would have to be proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, just like a murderer. And then they would either be sentenced to a life in prison or death, depending on, on if they were organizing a voter fraud uh, movement, as it were. If they were behind it, then I think it would, that would warrant the death penalty. Because what they've done is they've taken the lives of our soldiers who've died in battle to defend the freedoms of this country and totally crapped on their graves. Wow. Not, un- not unlike what I, th- the, uh, I know what some people are thinking right now. Well, not unlike some what the... Some people are uh, thinking that our president is, is one of those, those people. people. He may be, but he'd have to be proven guilty um, you know, in, a, jump, in a fair trial. To jump in here, perhaps the biggest voter fraud of all is the disenfranchisement of you know a huge proportion of the voters by the fact that even if you elect people, they are going to answer to very, very few handful of people who are the money power behind the campaigns and behind changing laws. So you're being defrauded every time you elect your official. But the uh, that's uh, why I say if it's a fair election, if it's a free election, and the people make a foolish choice in who they put in there, then they have no one to blame but themselves. That's just they're, like they're, they're not making the choice. Other people are making the choice. Voter fraud is, is, the, is the, the knife at the throat of our freedom, at the throat of the Constitution, because the Founding Fathers intended for the people to have the ultimate say in a representative democracy. They put the checks and balances in there so that they, in the heat of the moment, a rabble of angry people wouldn't do the wrong thing, which is, we've seen you know, in the French Revolution and a lot of history. So, so yeah, you, you get a direct democracy and you're in trouble. Well, and you know, there's um, in the blueprint, if you take a look, a total revamping of the system of electoral voting, uh, like many other countries have, with just as you order on Amazon and you do secure things on the Internet, and even our military uses the Internet to do secure things, they'll have a whole new voting system run by an independent nonprofit 
group which has an electoral commission to look over them an independent citizen commission and they will make sure our elections are fair and there's the voter fraud is a thing of the past as, as dozens of countries around the world have done over 10 years ago you know there's an oxymoron though in your statement when you say an independent commission there's no such thing every commission is is going to be influenced it's going to be hand picked how do you pick the commission who's going to decide who the elite are who decide that or how our election should but, go but right now we have no oversight at all all I ask is look at the example of how things are done much better in other countries, and we can copy their example. Well, that's all I'm saying is let's have oversight as in a constitutional amendment and put it in there for federal elections, not for the states. They can be as corrupt as they want. But if you're electing a congressman, a senator, a president, someone at, at the federal level, have that constitutional amendment, make sure voter ID is shown, make sure that there is no fraud, and if fraud is detected, prosecute it with the full fury of the law. What would be the death penalty? What uh, ACORN is accused of doing, would that be the death Some penalty? Some of that, I think, would warrant the death penalty, yes, because that's organizing this fraud. That's, that's facilitating and organizing the fraud. The poor dupe that's talked into doing it, no. I think they should uh, they should get a stint in the prison at hard labor. And 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 I think that this this group, most of the group, not all because they're varied, but I think this group in uh, Occupy Washington or Occupy all this stuff, they're they're just asking for free stuff. They're the the kind of rabble that could totally destroy this democracy if if their voices were given the sway in a constitutional convention. They'd vote themselves you know, free educations, free lunches, free vacations, free whatever provided by the government. I've just, heard like Europeans, what, just like what all the legislators do now. Exactly. I've heard so many Europeans talk about their government provides this and their government provides that. And I just look at them and sometimes I challenge them, but I just look at them and I think, you idiot. It's the, some poor, hardworking sap that's being taxed to death that's providing it. It's not your government. Bruce, what do you think of the notion of Phil in Santa Cruz for president? Well, <laughs> don't know. Don't know. Uh, I would invite Phil uh, to come to Radical Remake, either in Facebook or on the web. We've got a, a site, and I would invite him, please, to put his ideas in there. These are needed. We need a critical mass of people to put their ideas in there. I get these uh, surveys from various political organizations. Oh, take this survey and, uh, you know, fill out this thing and tell us what you think about 15 or 20 different things. And then at the end, it's, no, oh, by the way, give us money. And I, that's, that's the same attitude I have toward giving you my ideas because it's like all you're after is just placate somebody, maybe get a contribution. Do you have a contribution checkbox in your, in your website, by the way? Absolutely not. This is a uh, volunteer effort. Now, aren't you ashamed, Phil, in Santa Cruz? Don't you feel ashamed now? now? I just asked the question. But, he's, but Bruce has just proven to you that he's not what you suspected he might be. Someone just like me who will happily t accept donations for, to KSCO. <laughs> well, then I must ask Bruce, where does he get his funding for the website? I put my own money into it, Phil. Well, good for you. You don't get any, anything from uh, moveon.org or any of those other organizations. No, I just, have, I just have to answer 100 emails a day, and it, it takes up way too much time. Bruce is a very uh, competent and well-rewarded, in fact, probably very wealthy man. And I think he's putting his money where his mouth is. Well, good for him. I just think he I, needs to uh, study, uh, be aware of the dangers of a, of a runaway uh, constitutional convention and the rabble of the majority. I One wish I was wealthy, by the way, but I have to report not. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, but you do put your money where your mouth is if you're self-funded. I think that's great. My hat's off to you for that, we wealthy what? or not. And everybody's definition of wealthy. And in fact, I think you are wealthy. You're a, v a very wealthy person in terms of of being a good person and being someone, someone who wants to help. Wants you know, well, the founding fathers wants were very solutions instead of just bitching. You know, so. yeah, they were very concerned about the tyranny of the majority in a pure democracy. You can, if if you can convince a majority. You know, like Abe Lincoln said, uh, uh, you can conv convince most of the people some of the time. And if you had a pure democracy, that's all you would need to do is to convince most of the people at one moment in time, and it would be all over. That's how Hitler took over Germany. Got to move on to other callers here. Let's go to uh, Ben and Salinas. A uh, quick Ben, you're on the air. This is the great Ben responding to Phil. Yes, he made the comment about people too stupid to know which what those. Uh, 
screwed up voting machines in Florida. I agree with the, with Phil. Yes, the people that stole the election in 2000 should be executed for the damage that the Bush crime family did to America. America is not yet spelled with a K, y'all. And remember, on the Constitutional Convention, on the first day that they will bring up, and it can happen because my dentist is also a lawyer, he says on the first day of the convention, they will, not maybe, but they will suspend the entire Bill of Rights, and you will never get it back. So swallow that one, teabaggers. Have a nice day. Was that a nice thing to call the tea partiers, teabaggers? That's a terrible nasty. Everything Ben just said was negated when he called them teabaggers. Don't you agree, Bruce? Yeah, I, I've had to address this online. So some of the comments in Facebook, I've said, look, if we can't be respectful of others and groups and opinions and wishes uh, that people have, then, you know, if someone can't be respectful, if someone is downright disrespectful. That was not, the most not, disrespectful call of the day. No, yeah, no not, question. They're not, they're not getting themselves a seat at the table. I mean, that's just normal human decency. Right. Okay, here's Sun in Santa Cruz, a.k.a. Mrs. Future, yes? Hey, hi. Hi, Mrs. Betty. Future, how are you? Nice show, stimulating conversation. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, people have all these fears about what happens when we reexamine our institutions, and, you know, there's all this idea that somehow if we have a constitutional convention or if we try to use real democracy instead of representative democracy, that that somehow throws away the freedom that we believe in. I'd just like to say that I think that we have tools available now that we did not have available in the past. And in the past, the reason that we were able to formulate our ideas as clearly as we did and create the Constitution and the Bill of Rights is because we had a civilized procedure for conducting a conversation. And I think that the way that the Internet facilitates the voices of so many more individuals than was ever possible in the past, and the way that the availability of all of those various opinions can be sifted for the best ideas, and the way that we can map those ideas for true consensus these tools have never existed before, and if anything, they will help us with our democracy so that even if it's not, you know, majority rules, 50 percent, you know, is the tyranny of the majority of the other 50 percent, which really, if you look at how the elections are right now, the, the stagnation is all about the fact that so many people don't get their vote because such a minority gets theirs, that true plurality is good for democracy and coming up with ways to include more voices and have more levels of democracy you know like if we could assign different votes to sometimes we need ninety percent of the people to agree and sometimes we need like ten percent of the people to agree oh, i don't know about ten percent but anyhow we want to thank you for your call we, we have just a minute left want to get rory in but thank you son appreciate the call to the saturday special yeah, thanks. thanks. Good job. Okay, thanks. Here's Rory. Go ahead, Rory. You're the last call today because Richard and Watsonville hung up. Okay. Uh, number one, uh, Phil in Santa Cruz for Congress, you should, you should consider running. I agree with many of the callers that said a constitutional convention is scary because you can throw the whole Constitution out as it stands, and that's the way the founders made it. That's the way they draft it. I mean, that's, they put that in there. So you can throw the Bill of Rights out. You get rid of the Second Amendment, First Amendment. So I don't think we need to go that far. We can certainly amend the Constitution. And then the other thing is we are not a democracy. We are a representative republic. I can't that, overstate that. Is true. that. that hey, want to thank that. it's the well, end of the show. Sorry, Bruce, thanks for being with us. That's it. See you next week, Paul. You are listening to KSCO Santa Cruz, Salinas, Monterey, San Jose. I'm sorry, baby, but I really gotta go to KSCO Radio. Bye. While the themes in the Levity Zone are mostly a mixture of science and vision yielding a sense of purpose and hope for humanity, and we hope for you, the listeners, 
The whole human enterprise can be dashed on the rocks by the dual destructive bad habits of corrupting influence and disastrous leadership. So as alternative thinkers, we have to put some of our formidable creative energy, personal and community will, and bodies on the block toward causes which push back against these bad habits and reclaim our collective future. Let's continue this dialogue started back in 2011 here in the Levity Zone. Join our mailing list and post in our new forum at www.levityzone.org. Thanks again, KSCO and Michael Zwirling, for the recording of this show, and for Al and Sun Lundell for making it all possible.